Hi, I'm Les Leopold, and I'm here to walk you through the basics of runaway inequality. Uh, we're going to start with a uh, question about how big is the pay gap between the top 100 CEOs and the average worker. For every dollar the average worker makes, how much does a top CEO earn? Well, if you ask this question uh, to most Americans, they'll come up with something like 40 to 1. And as we can see from this next chart, in fact, in 1970, it was about 45 to 1. But since then, it's grown astronomically. It's as if the American people have not yet caught up with the new reality of runaway inequality. They're still back here in 1970. So they're kind of missing this gap. Today, the top 100 CEOs average around $30 million a year. The average worker, only 35, 36,000 a year. We need to understand why this is happening. Our story starts here with this basic chart that of all the charts we're going to go through, this might be the most important one to try to understand. So let's take our time with it. The top line here is a measure of productivity from 1947 until today. And productivity, you've all heard that word used again and again, has a very specific meaning. It measures how much we produce per hour of labor. And what this chart shows is that productivity has been rising and rising and rising, and that we now produce more than three times per hour what we produced back in 1947. That's a huge jump. The second line, this blue line, is a measure of the average weekly wage uh, of the non-supervisory and production worker. That's about 85% of all the working people in this country. And this number, this line is measured in current dollars, so we've taken inflation out of the picture. This is real buying power. And you can see during this period from 1947 till the mid-late 1970s, productivity and wages rose together year after year. During this period, most working people actually saw an increase in their standard of living year by year by year. You know, I was in graduate school right about here, and they taught us that these two lines were joined at the hip, that it was an iron law that wages and productivity had to go up together. No sooner did I graduate than they repealed the law. And now uh, wages actually have gone down slightly while productivity continued to rise and rise and rise. This is a huge change. Right? This is an enormous change, and if we can understand what happened here, we'll have the key, I believe, to runaway inequality. So the first question is, why did the two lines pull apart? That's what we're going to explore next. The ILO, the International Labor Organization, uh, conducted an incredible study in 2012 where they tried to understand in developed nations why did wages stagnate? They knew that in the 70 countries they looked at, it didn't stagnate the same way in every country. So maybe they could figure out the reasons. Well, the usual suspects uh, that I always came up with were things like globalization, outsourcing, uh, cuts in government programs, attacks on labor, technology automation. And they, of course, looked at those causes. But they found that only 10% of the problem uh, could be attributed to technology. 19% to globalization, 25% to attacks on government programs and unions, and a whole 45%, the biggest cause was something called financialization. Financialization, what is that? What does that possibly mean? Well, in, in their study, it meant those countries that had the biggest Wall Street type operations had the most uh, stagnated wages. So there was some connection uh, in their study between activity on Wall Street and uh, the flattening of wages. Let's take a look at that a little more closely. This next chart is a humdinger. <laughs> the bottom line is average uh, yearly wages in the non-financial sector. The top line are average yearly wages in the financial sector. 
And what you can see is between 40, uh, 1947 and roughly the late 70s, uh, the two lines, once again, were joined together. It didn't matter whether you worked at GM or worked for uh, Citibank, uh, given your level of experience, uh, skill, education, uh, you earned about the same. Then all of a sudden, there was this huge premium for working on Wall Street. So we can see from that huge premium that something uh, about financialization is, must be connected to the wage gap. And if we look at this chart, lo and behold, the productivity, this is the productivity uh, wage gap, and this is the financial sector, non-financial sector wage gap. They're shaped the same. So the, our guess is that runaway inequality has a lot to do with the money going to Wall Street. So that leads us to our next question, which is, what happened? Well, back in uh, the 1970s, a new philosophy of economic policy uh, uh, had captured the academic community, uh, uh, starting out of the University of Chicago around a guy named Milton Friedman. Uh, and this philosophy, which we call the better business climate philosophy, uh, uh, was very powerful because what it said was that if you cut taxes, especially on the wealthy, and cut regulations and uh, government regulations, get the government out of the economy, cut back social spending so that people would go out there and work and not rely on government handouts, you would get an enormous profits boom. And that boom would lead to more investment, jobs, incomes, and all boats would rise. And, and, and this philosophy was sold because the 1970s were a very tumultuous period where we had rising unemployment and we had inflation and uh, government officials were at their wits end to figure out what to do about it. Uh, and this philosophy came to the rescue because they said, oh gee, uh, we, all we have to do is cut taxes, cut regulations, cut back the government and we'll get out of this mess. And uh, Ron, it began at the end of the Carter administration. Uh, the deregula de deregulation of finance began then, deregulation of trucking, airlines, telecommunications. And then when Ronald Reagan came in, this became uh, the philosophy of both political parties. So that, with that philosophy in mind, we have to now look at how did so much wealth end up on Wall Street and with the top CEOs? How did that actually happen from that better business climate model? Uh, and, and that's a very interesting story that I want to walk you through. First step was that when deregulation came in, uh, these, this group of financiers called corporate raiders uh, became uh, uh, enamored with the idea of buying up corporations uh, with very little of their own money. They would borrow a huge amount of money, buy up a corporation, and then figure out how to make it uh, uh, pull wealth out of those companies. And what they did was they just, uh, this would not have necessarily been allowed before deregulation, but now it was okay to do it. So they bought, they, they used a lot of borrowed money and bought up company after company after company. That was step one. Step two is as soon as they uh, bought the company, uh, they had the uh, company was now stuck. The new company that they bought was stuck with the loans. It would be as if when you bought a car, your car paid back the loan instead of you. So uh, uh, this made it very easy to buy up companies. If you weren't stuck, you, the key investor, was not stuck, were not stuck with the uh, uh, loan. So the comp what they did is right off the top of that, of that huge uh, pile of debt is they paid themselves back a special dividend. And by paying themselves back, they, they almost uh, got all their money back right off the top. They also gave some to the CEOs and to the bankers that put together the deal. And then, of course, they just made the company was now saddled with uh, debt. And this happened again and again and again, and companies got saddled with more and more debt. Step three, you had to change, you had to change the way in which the CEOs were paid. This is critical. You had to pay them through stock options and stock incentives. Back uh, in 1989, if we went back even further, this wasn't done at all. Back in 1980, very small percentage 
of uh, stock options and stock incentives were given to CEOs. But this started to change dramatically uh, where this is all CEOs, almost $10 million a year or more than $9 million a year uh, of, a, of a CEO's income comes from uh, stock incentives. And if you look at this, uh, today only 5.2% of a CEO's pay comes from salary and bonuses. Just about all the rest comes from stock, stock payments. So their, their, their head is entirely wrapped around the price of the stock. If the price of the stock goes up, they're going to make a lot of money. So that's all they care about. That's how they are going to get paid. So this was a huge shift. Now, ask yourself this question. If you're the CEO and you're paid with stock incentives, what would you do? What would you do? Well, obviously the first thing you would do, and the only thing you would do, is figure out ways to drive up the price of the stock. And they came up with a very ingenious way of doing it. They bought back their own stock. They used the company's money to buy back their own stock. Now, this is a very uh, interesting concept, and we've got to pause here for a second, so make sure you get it. When a company buys back its own stock, it reduces the number of shares in circulation. All things being equal, that has to increase the price of the stock. Imagine the following. There are two people that own a million dollar corporation. Each one has one share. One person buys out the other, retires that share. Now there's one share. Before, with two shares, each was worth $500,000. With one share, that share is now worth a million dollars. So they started, they realized, wow, this is great. We use the company's money, and we buy back our, 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 our own shares, uh, uh, the company's shares, raises the price of stock, and, and me, the CEO, gets richer and richer and richer through stock buybacks. Back in 1981, only 2% uh, of a company's profits, this is the top 500 companies, was used for stock buybacks, only 2%. By 2007, just before the crash, 75% of all corporate profits, of all corporate profits were used to buy back their own shares. They weren't using it to expand the business or to pay workers more or to do more R&D. They were using it to buy back their own shares. This is a, phenomena, a phenomenal change in the corporate culture. This is how a corporation becomes financialized. We now have a partnership between the investors, the top investors, the corporate raiders, now we call them hedge funds and private equity companies. They're now in bed with the CEOs and the top executives to jack up the price of the stock. The investors want what's called pump and dump. Pump up, the, pump up the shares, and then they sell out. And of course, the uh, CEOs basically want to do the same thing. Uh, drive up the uh, value of the shares, and then sell their shares and make a bundle. Now, all of this pressure on the company, the loans, the stock buybacks, all of this has consequences inside the company. Because without that profit to reinvest, you have to do things like downsizing through layoffs, ship production abroad, sell off product lines and divisions, speed up production, raid the pension funds or discontinue them, cut wages and benefits, and the culture changes from retain and reinvest to downsize and distribute. I mean, think about it. Aren't you wondering why it is that the company always says they never have enough money and that it's so hard to get increases in wages and benefits? This is why, or this is a big reason why, is they've got to pay back all those loans and they want to use that money to buy back all the shares that they can buy back to jack up the price of the stock and therefore jack up their own wages. So we now, uh, this whole process I like to call financial strip mining. The CEOs and Wall Street collude together to strip wealth mine the wealth from the company and get it out through interest payments on the massive debt that's now laid on top of the company. Oh, by the way, when the companies ran out of profits uh, to buy back shares, they took out more loans 
and use that to buy back shares. So the, the, the debt keeps piling on and piling on. So that's one way, the interest payments, that's one way that uh, the corporation is financially strip mined. There are fees to banks constantly and investment bankers to put together the deals. There are special dividends to the corporate raiders. And then most importantly, I believe, are the stock buybacks. We put this all together. What we have is a new thing called the financialized corporation. It is redesigned to extract wealth for financial elites and CEOs. That's what it's designed to do. Everything they do day in and day out, uh, the CEO is thinking, how do I extract value from this company and give it to the big stock owners, including themselves? All right. The outcome of this takes us back to our first charts. This is why average real wages are stagnated. This is why financial and CEO incomes have skyrocketed to 829 to 1. And this is why it's so hard to find uh, uh, good jobs and why benefits uh, are constantly under attack and for, especially for non-union workers, are declining or virtually non-existent in many places. This is what it means to financialize. This is the result of financialization. Now, this leads us to our fourth question, which is how does all this impact our communities? How does this impact public sector workers? I mean, we've been talking about private uh, corporations. Now, what about the rest of society? Uh, clearly, if this is happening to corporation after corporation, I mean tens of thousands of corporations have gone through this process and are going through it right now. If this is happening, it's got to have an impact on all of us. What are those impacts? Let's start here. This is the picture of corporate debt. As you can see, from 1945 all the way to the late 70s, there, almost was, there was virtually no corporate debt. But this process of loading companies up with debt to extract uh, uh, more and more wealth from them has led to a dramatic rise in corporate debt. And the thing about corporate debt, the interest payments on corporate debt are not taxable. So this huge increase in corporate debt has consequences for the public sector. It means the corporations are going to be able to shelter their income and stop paying corporate uh, as much uh, corporate tax. So the tax base is going to shift from corporations to everybody else through this process of loading companies up with debt. Let me show you what I mean. This is corporate taxes as a percent of state and local revenues. And it's declining. In 1980, it was about 6.3% of all the revenues. It's down to 3.8%. And so public sector workers and our services, uh, public services, are going to be constantly under attack. So you can have the wealthiest country in the history of the world having trouble maintaining its infrastructure, having trouble maintaining its educational systems, having trouble maintaining its public sector workforce. So that's one impact. Here's another impact. Runaway inequality guarantees that you're going to have this huge uh, uh, problem of collecting taxes from the super rich. Once you get to be super rich, you have at your disposal the ability to move your money anywhere in the world to avoid taxes. And it's estimated that we're losing $150 billion a year in offshore tax shelters that are set up, aided and abetted, by Wall Street. And this is a brief list of, this, of how much each state uh, is losing. These, top, these are the top 10 states uh, that are losing almost a billion dollars or more per year in revenues, tax revenues, that they should have received but aren't receiving. Because if you're in the top fraction of the top 1%, you are going to not pay a lot of tax uh, to the American government. You're going to hide your stuff in the Cayman Islands and all other lots of other places around the world. And this leads to this perverse phenomena now, which is the richer you are, the smaller a percent uh, you're paying in income taxes. This is called a regressive tax system. We're supposed to have progressive income taxes. We have a regressive income tax. The lowest 20% pay 10.9% on average in state and local taxes, the lowest 20%. The top 1% pay less than 
or almost, yeah, less than half uh, that amount, 5.4%. Uh, and look how it goes down. The richer you are, the less you pay. You go up the economic pyramid, you pay a smaller percent of your taxes. This is called regressive taxation, a direct result of the rich not paying their taxes and corporations paying lower taxes through the financialization process. Another big thing that happens is when the money concentrates in the hands of a few, you get these uh, uh, huge imbalance in uh, political donation. This, is, this, is ta this takes a look at super PAC contributions in 2014. Corporations and financial uh, service industries pay, uh, put $343.5 million into the uh, campaigns. Labor put in $54 million. Uh, single issues like environment, et cetera, put in $71 million. I mean, a huge uh, uh, influence of uh, corporations and the wealthy on the political system takes place. So this is going to distort democracy. So another impact of financialization is an incredible distortion of the democratic uh, system. Uh, here's another uh, example of what happens. As Wall Street got more and more powerful, a revolving door between Wall Street and government took place. And here's just one example. Uh, a guy named Michael Froman, during the Clinton administration, uh, uh, negotiated the elimination of the financial controls that separated commercial banking and investment banking, called Glass-Steagall. He's the person that spearheaded the charge to get rid of it. No sooner does he get rid of it, he leaves the Clinton administration and goes to Citigroup. For Citigroup, his job becomes to press the government to use trade agreements to uh, eliminate or uh, prevent regulations on Wall Street. Then he leaves Citigroup with a $4.5 million bonus. He goes to the Obama administration. What does he become? The chief negotiator of the TPP. And now the TPP contains uh, uh, positions that are advocated by Citigroup to make it harder to regulate Wall Street. That's a revolving door that just accelerates runaway inequality. Now, this whole financialization process leads to a new social philosophy and a very, very uh, uh, powerful uh, and, as I will show you in a moment, destructive philosophy. It has a few points. First of all, you, you don't get anything for nothing. If you want an education, you go into debt. If you're poor, you're, you're really supposed to fend for yourself. Don't expect anybody to give you anything. If you want a job, it's your responsibility. Go out and find it. Uh, if it's not there, keep looking. And if you want a poverty program, the only one you're going to get is by going to jail. And I'm not exaggerating any of these uh, points. Let's take a look at this. Before that better business climate model came in, uh, much of higher education in the United States was uh, virtually free or very low tuition. New York uh, uh, City and state and California had uh, free higher education systems. Most day schools were pretty inexpensive. If you had a good summer job, you could probably work your way through school quite easily without any debt. There was virtually no debt, uh, student debt, in the, in, uh, in the 1970s. Now it's enormous. It's, it's a trillion dollar industry. So students now are saddled with an uh, enormous amount of debt. They're being financialized. Uh, another problem that occurs is uh, youth unemployment. Uh, this is a uh, high school grad, 17 to 20 years old. Uh, if you're African American, 50% uh, of you are like more than 50% of you are likely to be uh, unemployed, uh, compared to 34% roughly for uh, white Americans, a little bit more for Latinos. So there's a, uh, a, a huge uh, unemployment problem. Well, back in the 60s and 70s, although uh, there were lots of problems, there was a huge effort to try to deal with youth unemployment, because we knew this was bad for society. Uh, there was a war on poverty. There were all kinds of experiments. Some worked, some didn't work. But there was a commitment to producing uh, training and even creating jobs through the government, if necessary, public jobs, so that these folks could go to work, these kids could go to work. Well, instead of that now, what we have is prison. Literally, the war on poverty has turned into 
prisons. We now have, this is the rise of the prison population, both in terms of absolute number and in terms of a percentage of the population. 1910, and all of a sudden, when that better, better business climate model takes in, the prison population explodes. We now have the most prisoners in the entire world. We have more than China and Russia, a higher percentage than any country and a higher absolute number. How is it that this happened? Well, when you stop dealing with uh, uh, poverty programs, something has to happen to, uh, with the people at the bottom of the economic ladder who are having difficulty finding work. They're being vacuumed up, vacuumed up into the prison system. And if you look uh, at uh, the crime rate, you can see that this is blue line here is the crime rate. It actually, uh, the crime rate and the prison population used to kind of rise and fall together. Now, this is violent crime. Uh, now there's a huge gap. Crime, isn't, crime wasn't going up, but the prison population continued to go up. Now, just check this out. This is our financialization chart from before. Uh, wages stayed together, then they split apart right around 1980, and the prison population right around 1980. What we're seeing is the rise of inequality, runaway inequality, and the prison population go hand in hand. And this is creating enormous problems for us, uh, especially for black communities. This is why they're concerned about uh, uh, the criminal justice system. This is why, we're, why, why uh, people are so upset about it. If you, if you look back in the early 80s, yes, there was a gap between, uh, this is, the red line is black uh, male prison population, the white line, and this is the rate uh, of incarceration, the white line is, uh, I mean the blue line is, are white males. And you can see they were pretty close together. Yes, there was, uh, blacks were disproportionately uh, in prison back in the early 80s. But then the focus really became on uh, black Americans. It, it, you can see how for black youth this became the poverty program, put them in jail. And you could understand why young black uh, uh, folks would be concerned about the criminal justice system when you're faced with this incredible gap. Uh, the rates of incarceration now are so much higher uh, for the Latino population, it's two and a half times higher than whites. The black population, prison population is five and a half times higher than whites. So there, there's something going on here. So we can see here is that Ferguson and many other counties around uh, St. Louis and around the country began to counter the impacts of financialization by squeezing the poor. That's what they're doing. And when the poor in the area are disproportionately black, uh, uh, the squeeze can easily lead to not just racial tension, but actual deaths, like what happened to Michael Brown. Now, some people may say, well, are these folks really out there trying to find jobs? Well, this, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we can see here uh, the government collects statistics about who's actively seeking work when they're unemployed. And it turns out that uh, uh, black women and black men are more eager to find work than even white women and white men. And this makes sense because uh, due to years of uh, institutional uh, discrimination, uh, black families have less wealth behind them, and it's harder for them to survive during periods of unemployment. So they're going to be even more eager to find work. Now stop for a second and think, what happened to Eric Garner, uh, the man who was killed uh, in Staten Island? What was he doing? He was working. He was selling loose cigarettes. That was his job. And he was killed while doing his job because that was considered a, uh, a nuisance uh, crime, and he was being vac vacuumed up in the criminal justice system. He was someone who was working. That was his job. So that's what I mean by the transformation of the war on poverty into the prison system. All right, our last question is what do we do about Wall Street and runaway inequality. What do we do about financialization? 
This has got to be uh, the foremost question on our minds. Well, to, to answer it, we need to go over two key facts. The first one is that runaway inequality will not cure itself. There's nothing in the economy that acts like a pendulum, where we go from uh, more uh, inequality to less inequality. We thought the business cycles would do that, but with this process of financialization, the business cycle no longer does that. Uh, we've had a so-called recovery since 2008. But it turns out that 95% of all the new wealth created, uh, in, or new income created by that recovery has gone to the top 1%. 95% of all that new income has gone to the top 1%. So that pendulum isn't swinging towards uh, less inequality. It's continually moving towards more inequality, and more rapidly so. That's why we refer to it as runaway inequality. So that's fact number one. And here's fact number two, and this may be uh, uh, difficult for us to uh, accept, but I, I believe it's absolutely true, which is we can't change this without building a massive popular movement. We need a massive movement to counter runaway inequality. The, the stuff we're doing today, as good as it may be, is not enough. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how this, what we're doing now and, and what more needs to be done. We've got unions like the CWA and other unions you know, uh, uh, fighting against their corporations. We've got the People's Climate March. We've got the Fight for 15. We have Black Lives Matter. But so many of these activities are being done in their own silo. Uh, what unites them is runaway inequality, but we don't have a movement yet that's clearly focused on runaway inequality. So instead, what we have are excellent organizers, excellent people building uh, terrific movements, but they're all separate. And uh, it's unclear whether uh, this can lead towards uh, a real assault on runaway inequality. Uh, to get a sense of what it takes, I want to take you back to the populist movement in, in the 1880s uh, and early and uh, 1890s. This was the last real strong period of uh, mass organizing against Wall Street. Far, small farmers at that point, especially in the Midwest and the South, were absolutely furious at, at uh, the loans they were saddled with and the monetary policies uh, controlled, totally controlled at that time by Wall Street. So they built a, a huge movement. And uh, that movement at, uh, called for consumer and producer co-ops, public banks, public ownership of railroads, telegraph, telephone industries, and a progressive income tax. That's what they fought for. And, uh, what, they, what they did, uh, they had to organize uh, incredibly hard uh, uh, to pull this off. So, I ask, so the question that we now want to ask is, well, what's our agenda going to look like 